Welcome to all the virtual members of Columbine United Church. It's so good to have you here. Those of you who didn't make it to church today, but you want to find out what's going on, great to have you here. Those of you from across the United States, on the other side of the pond, it's great to have you as well. Especially our men and women in uniform who always check in with going, what's going on here at your church home. It's great to have you as well. Let's give these folks a warm Columbine welcome. We have a wonderful opportunity to celebrate our Earth Day weekend here at Columbine United Church. We have the Reverend Peter Sautel. Peter is a um, longtime member of the, of the Rocky Mountain Conference, United Church of Christ. He's been an ordained pastor for over 40 years, and his passion is Echo Justice Ministry. Uh, he's been working with congregations um, up and down the Front Range throughout Colorado and on the others um, around the United States and even internationally as well. And so on our green team, we have a, a green team that is helping us begin the conversation of Echo Justice Ministries here at Columbine. When we wanted to think about a great way to celebrate Earth Day weekend, we thought, let's bring Peter in to preach uh, for us. And so it's a great privilege to have Reverend Peter Sautel here. So Peter, why don't you come forward? Let's give Peter a warm call. Columbine, welcome. Thank you, Steve. Whoop, we're a little bit live on that. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. It is great to be here. Uh, I'm standing at a podium and working from a text because I am passionate about faith and the environment, and if I don't stick to my text, I tend to go on for 45 minutes or an hour. So. That's why I'm paying attention to the notes. Our scripture lesson for today comes from Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, a church that had quite a bit of disagreement and argument and uh, factions within it. And so Paul brought a word that was pertinent to that church and for all of us. He says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. May God bless these words to our understanding. In many churches, when I turn up to be a visiting preacher, there is a part of the service known as the children's sermon. It's a five-minute piece or so, which I have to confess, generally delivers a greater truth in more understandable terms than that larger part of the sermon we call the grown-ups sermon. That is a humbling realization for a preacher. When I'm asked to do that part of the service in the children's sermon, I love to use an old African folk tale. The full version of the story has lots of elaborate details and funny animal sounds and is far too long to get into this morning, but a brief version is worthwhile. The story depends on two characters, the evil and foolish chieftain who imposes his will on the town and the wise old woman who is the only one who is able to speak truth to the chieftain. One night, the frogs in a nearby pond are making an especially loud racket, and they keep the chieftain awake. He wakes up the next morning grumpy and tells all of the people that they need to go to the pond and kill all the frogs. And the woman tells the chieftain that he's an idiot, and he will soon discover that all things are connected. Sure enough, a few days later, the village is overwhelmed with swarms of mosquitoes because the frogs had kept the bugs under control. All things are connected. 
I love to tell that story to the kids because I get to make the frog sounds. Reedy, reedy, reedy. And because all things are connected is a perspective that goes to the heart of our Christian faith. This morning, as we celebrate the Earth Day weekend, I come to you with good news about our relational world. I come with a brief reminder about some of the bad news that those relationships have become severely distorted, and lots more good news about the promise of reconciliation. That old African story teaches us about the connection between frogs, mosquitoes, and a livable village. That's one expression of a universal truth. All things are connected. Everything, everywhere. That's an old lesson that modern science is confirming. We live in an inherently relational universe. At every level, we find relationships. Little tiny atoms form slightly larger molecules because of the relationship between subatomic particles. At the other extreme, enormous galaxies are held in spirals or clusters by the relational force of gravity. Without those forces that hold things together, our universe could not exist. The science of chemistry details those molecular relationships, and physics attempts to explain other forces. And we see them at layers in between. In recent years here in Colorado, we've seen that the health of our beautiful forest is shaped by the intersection of trees and soil, rain and snow, bugs and birds, temperature and fire. It's an incredible interplay of factors all in relationship with each other. In our human communities, the sciences of sociology and economics explore some of our relationships, mediated through institutions like government, families, churches, schools, and banks. That mysterious hand of the marketplace, the invisible hand of the marketplace, works so well because we're all related in our systems. The decisions that we each make about how to use our money and our time ripple through and touch everyone around us in ways that influence us all. The relatively new science of ecology looks at the relationships that flow through the entire web of life. The actions of predators clearly impact their prey and the life chances of their opportunities. The health of ecosystems influence all of the diverse kinds of animals and plants within that life zone. Species involve an intimate relationship with the other creatures around them, so that one, for many kinds of plants, one very particular kind of bug or bird is necessary to do the work of pollination. Those relationships are very particular. An amazing example of ecological relationships comes from Yellowstone National Park. Wolves had been wiped out there during the early 20th century, and they were reintroduced to the park in 1995, and the results were amazing. One report describes some of what happened. Since wolves have returned to Yellowstone, the elk and deer are stronger, the aspens and willows are healthier, and the grasses are taller. For example, when wolves chase elk during a hunt, the elk are forced to run farther and faster. As the elk run, their hooves aerate the soil, allowing more grasses to grow. Since the elk cannot remain stationary for too long, aspens and willows in one area are not heavily grazed and therefore can fully recover between migrations. Coyotes have been outcompeted, and with fewer coyotes hunting small rodents, raptors like the eagle and osprey have more prey and are making a comeback. A wild wolf population actually makes for a stronger, healthier, and more balanced ecosystem. Yes, all things are connected. 
Science reveals that the web of relationships is built into the very structure of the universe and form the basis of all life. That perspective on the world, though, is not a new discovery. They've always been evident to those who pay attention. Psalm 104 is an old, old hymn celebrating the God of creation. There are pieces of it that read like a textbook example from an ecology class. Praise is offered to God because life flourishes in the context of ecological niches and healthy habitats. Listen to a few verses from the middle of the psalm. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills, giving drink to every wild animal. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By the streams, the birds of the air have their habitation. They sing among the branches. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them, the birds build their nests. The stork has its home in the fir tree. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the conies. You make darkness and it is night when the animals of the forest come creeping out. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from their god. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. People go out to their work and their labor until the evening. The psalmist knew that water and rocks, trees and grass determine what can live where. Some animals are active during the day, some at night. What a marvelous world, what a marvelous universe, all held together by a web of relationships that is far beyond our understanding or our control. But really, what else would we expect from our God who seems to cherish relationships? God is love is the concise definition given in 1 John. The primary quality of God is to be in relationship. So it is not at all surprising that God would create a universe that depends on all things being in right relationship. All things are connected, not by accident or incidentally. That is the way the universe works. No one, no thing exists alone or outside of relationships. We are all tied to God, to each other, and to the whole created order. Thanks be to God. Now, within that whole vast interconnected wonder of God's creation, our human species does have a unique characteristic. Our kind appears to be the only part of God's creation with a propensity or even a desire to distort and to break down the web of interconnections around us. In theological language, that propensity to break relationships is called sin, and we humans excel at it. We've shattered and mangled our relationships with God, and we've done the same with all of our friends and all of our far-flung neighbors. Sin in our personal lives and our human society is a common theme for Christians. The presence of sin and injustice in all of our stressed and broken relationships goes to the very heart of why our gospel and our faith are so important. As I've grown into an ecological understanding of the Christian faith, my sense of sin includes the fracture that has developed between humans and the rest of creation. In our modern technological, scientific, and business-oriented world, we look at the world very differently than the writer of Psalm 104, who had that joyous description of nature. Rather than seeing a world filled with life and relationship in which all things praise God, we have tended, broadly speaking, to see the world as a collection of independent things. It is stuff that exists in isolation. We tend to see resources around us sitting there just waiting for us to use them. We think of pests that get in our way, whether they're 
plants or bugs or germs or maybe even other people. And when they get in our way, we want to remove them. Over and over again, our modern society has ignored the web of relationships that support and sustain the natural world. We have thought and acted as if we are separate from nature, and we have imagined that we can chew up and use the natural world without causing impacts that spread far and wide in the web of life. If sin is the presence of broken and distorted relationships, then humans have sinned deeply against God and creation. In the words of one recent theological document, we have become uncreators. Now, you'll be glad to know that I am not going to run through a long list of catastrophic environmental issues this morning. I think each one of you can probably make a list of the things that you know about and care about. But I will touch briefly on one example of those strange, distorted relationships. Our industrial food system these days has turned creatures into commodities and turned living beings into agents of production that are cruelly exploited. We speak of factory farms, and you've probably heard about the way that chickens are treated in many of those facilities, crammed into tiny cages. Cages are about the size of a sheet of standard paper with two or three birds put into one cage. And their hormones are, and life cycles are adjusted. Their beaks are cut off so they can't peck at each other. They are terribly and tragically treated. It's a perversion of the joyous creation that we heard about in the psalm, where the birds nest and sing in appropriate habitats as expressions of God's glory. We have not recognized or honored or respected the world of relationships in which we live. We have sinned by creating God's creation simply as things. That blindness and that folly is at the heart of the environmental crisis. The same sort of sin that troubles our human relationships is at play in our abuse of the rest of creation. Well, I did promise good news, and it is theological good news. Caring for creation is not an extraneous sidebar to our faith. It is a basic proclamation of the Christian gospel. Paul wrote to that conflicted church in Corinth that God, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to God's self, not counting their trespasses against them. Reconciling, what a powerful word, word. in Christ, God repairs and restores broken relationships. God reaches out to reconcile us with God's self, forgiving the trespass, offering a fresh start. So, Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. That forgiveness, that grace, that reconciliation is the distinctive message of the Christian faith. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Now listen carefully to the language of that sentence. Did you catch the surprising word there? God was reconciling the world. In Greek, God was reconciling the cosmos, the whole of creation. All of those broken relationships are a part of God's reconciliation. Yes, the gospel is about our personal relationship with God. And it is about our social sin and evil among our human sisters and brothers. And the gospel is about the healing of our ecological sin with all of our neighbors throughout all of the web of life. In Christ, God was reconciling the world, restoring all of the broken and distorted relationships. Thanks be to God. But you know, there's still one more zinger in that passage from 2 Corinthians. God was in Christ reconciling the world. And Paul says, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God is entrusting the message of reconciliation to us 
So we are ambassadors for Christ. There it is. Since God is making his appeal through us. It is not enough for us to receive the message of reconciliation and the promise of reconciliation. We are to be agents of reconciliation, ambassadors for Christ. We are to be doing the work of healing and restoring broken relationships, reaching out into all of the world, into all of the creation, embodying and expressing and proclaiming the good news of reconciliation. We who are new creations through the gift of reconciliation are, give, are given the gift and the ministry of taking that out into the whole world. We are to be about the godly work of healing and restoring broken relationships wherever they are to be found. We are to go about the ministry of reconciliation in our personal relationships, in social justice, and in ecological healing. We are called to do that ministry of reconciliation in a world that is inherently relational. From the tiniest atom to the farthest galaxy, all things are connected. And so restoring wolves to Yellowstone is an act of reconciliation. Insisting that chickens be treated with some decency and care is an act of reconciliation. And those are but two examples of the settings where we are called to make things new and whole. God has entrusted that ministry of reconciliation to us as a part of the Christian gospel and the Easter possibilities. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, a ministry that calls us to reach out to all parts of the earth community into all parts of creation. That ministry of reconciliation stands in stark contrast to the way of exploitation and use, which are so deeply embedded in modern society. An African folktale, an ancient biblical song, and the discoveries of modern science tell us the same thing. All things are connected. The universe is filled with relationships, and many of those relationships have been broken by human sin. That sin is the source of what we now call the environmental crisis. The Christian gospel is all about the forgiveness of sin and reconciliation in the presence of broken relationships. That good news is a gift of grace from God, the God that we know as love, the God who calls us toward peace and justice in all of our relationships. God calls us to be ambassadors of reconciliation, ambassadors of healing to all broken relationships. Today, as we observe the Earth Day weekend and every day, may we go about that ministry of reconciliation with hope and with joy. Amen. <laughs>